good. Um, okay, I couldn't think of a better audience for what I'm gonna say. I'm really excited to tell this story. It's kind of a long story. Uh, there is some take home message that will be obvious from the beginning and then as much as you can follow, I'm happy. Uh, these are the collaborators who like, this is like more like 10, 10 years of work or more than that. Um, so there's people here in the audience. Uh, I also want to thank my sponsors, especially this one. Uh, so it's basically, I'm gonna talk about scattering so, and transport. So what happens uh, in electronic systems when electrons are scattered by bosons? So this is a typical picture of this. And uh, what I'm gonna try to convince you is that there are uh, cases where it's better not to think about scattering uh, of electrons to bosons, but uh, you better take a different starting point. And this starting point is that if these bosons are very slow, they actually create some kind of static landscape. And then we know what happens when there is a static landscape that is disordered, we get undertone localization. And so this might be a better starting point for some problems. Um, so this is my plan. I will start from where we started this thing 10 years ago, and it was organic semiconductors. Uh, these share the same crystal structure as most of the organic metals that we have heard about here. Uh, this phenomenon that I called, we call transient localization uh, was proven here, and then we decided uh, inspired by Luca de Medici, who wanted me to give a talk at a conference about metals. He said, why don't you apply this to metals? And then we we tried and uh, we, we were able to prove that this also works not only in semiconductors, but in metals. And then I will talk about uh, something that is probably of interest to uh, some here that is organic, to the organic metals. So, for this to work, I mean, no, I'm talking as interesting as the person wants to For this to work, I guess, loads of people that are unfolding. Well, they could. If I were to have a bank of these, I could just order something. Yes. That makes no order. But from spatial correlations of my discipline, I wouldn't tend to do that. Well, it depends on how, it depends on the details of the correlation. You can have localization with correlated disorder. You can, but it depends. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, but here we are at, at the level of proof of principle. So we, we okay. can add. Yeah, I could have some system that is at long range spatial for yes. all of it. Yes. Yes. I think so. Actually, there's people uh, who are trying to apply this to acoustic phonons that are spread and correlated, and it still works. Well, anyway. Right. So uh, this is the thing. Uh, we started from this problem of organic semiconductors. So this is a, an arrow here depicting the mobility that you encounter in many semiconductors. On this side, you have like crystalline silicon and graphene. You can apply block Boltzmann theory. Everything is fine. When you're on the other end here, this is all amorphous, disordered, and then you use popping theories. But these organic crystals happen to be in the middle, and then you don't know which one to use. And uh, so chemists will tell you that these crystals are very soft, the molecules are very heavy, and this makes intermolecular fluctuations uh, quite wide and very slow. And so uh, there were a lot of puzzles in the experiments that couldn't be understood, and then we tried to understand with others uh, if there was another possible approach for this problem. So uh, I take this basically from Martin's book, uh, very simple view of block Boltzmann theory. So you choose a reference state where you have no scattering. So everything is ballistic. If you throw an electron, it will live forever and 
and have a velocity that is a constant. And the current is just the charge, charge the current by, of that carrier is the charge times the velocity. Now, uh, if I want to uh, do a Kubo type of description of um, transport and optical conductivity, I need the correlation function of the velocity. But you see, if this is a constant, then this is a constant. And the Kubo formula tells me that the optical conductivity will be proportional to the Fourier transform of a constant. So Fourier transform of a constant is just a spike here. This is never what we see. Okay, but there is relaxation, there is some diffusion. And then what you do is uh, you have some, you apply this relaxation time approximation and say that, well, of course, correlations decaying time, let's take an exponential because it's easy. And then because also it's motivated by uh, what happens in nature. We all know that if we Fourier transform an exponential, we get a Lorentzian. And uh, this looks much more like what is measured in good systems. Um, okay, good systems. Now imagine you have some system where scattering is very strong. So this, this starts from the zero scattering limit. So if scattering is very strong, maybe it's not the right starting point. So let's play this game and say, okay, imagine that our starting point is very different. It's actually a localized one. Now we know things about this correlation function. And one thing is that it's integral over time gives the diffusion constant. So the integral must be zero if it's localized because there is no conduction. And this means that the shape of this has a positive area here and a negative area here that are equal. So the corresponding optical conductivity uh, doesn't go up to here, but it has to go back to zero at zero frequency because this is the conductivity. Now let's apply the relaxation time approximation to this. If we do, what happens is that I will reduce the weight of the long time backscattering. This is just saying that velocity is opposite to the initial one. So this will kill the backscattering and then I will restore some finite conductivity. So I get a situation that is in between the Drude and the Anderson insulator. So this was the message. I can stop here. Okay, let's go a bit further. Um, so one consequence is that if this is true, you should observe displaced Drude peaks all over the place. Um, when? Well, actually, when the dynamics of this disorder potential is much slower than the time it takes uh, to localize. So you have precise conditions telling you when you observe this displaced root peak and when you don't. Um, so, of course, we started from these organic systems. And uh, here, because the dynamics of the molecules is very slow, it was and and disorder is very strong. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. At low temperatures, you can. And uh, there is some hint in the literature. We are now solving the, the, by finer temperature lunches. Yeah, but at high temperature, you kill that thing. And then this is what you get. OK, I was saying we started from this problem. and. It was for a reason because we thought that that was the solution. And actually this peak has been observed in uh, organic semiconductors. Um, 
Now, um, note that because of this dip here, the conductivity is much lower than the semi-classical value, and then you expect some anomalous transports, like bad semiconductor here. So I said this already, who is this time scale? Uh, let's go be, uh, a bit further in this. So this is a snapshot of your mole molecules at some time, and then you have Anderson localization if this is not moving, but Anderson localization comes from interferences, and then if you shake your potential, you are destroying these interferences, and then uh, these electrons can escape their uh, potential wells. And so it's only reasonable to expect that uh, this relaxation time that we have introduced is related to the motion of this disorder potential, which is written here. Okay, so uh, a bit more on this thing, consequences for transport. Uh, first of all, uh, you can write the mobility and therefore the conductivity. Now, you don't describe this in terms of effective mass and scattering time, but more in terms of some localization length and some trial rate that is related to the frequency of the bosons that create this potential. Um, interestingly, that was one of the puzzles in the organics. You get a power law for the conduction, uh, even though there is localization, which was kind of a puzzle. And also, because resistivity is increasing or mobility is decreasing, you get a, this breakdown of the mott yacht regel criterion that was also uh, one of the puzzles. What's the time? Okay, so that was historical perspective. Now, th these were semiconductors. Nobody cares about that. Let's go to metals. Um, so there's plenty of these displays through the peaks around in correlated metals and also in these organics. Uh, this is a quarter film. This is a theta. This is a kappa uh, measurements by organizers. Uh, Interestingly, so there is a lot of them, and there is also this temperature dependence that hints at something related to some degree of freedom that can be uh, excited by temperature. And the Coopers are up here also. Uh, it is severely on. Well, everything is normal, I guess. Well, no, it's not normal, but you don't have to display it. Well, I think, exactly. well, I think that maybe even in the underdoped, sometimes you get a Druda and sometimes you don't. I don't know. It's, it's, but I don't, you don't even display it. yeah. Okay, so there was this first attempt to give an, a unified view of this phenomenon of display through the peaks by Sean Hartnell and others. And, uh, so they were uh, studying this fluctuating charge density waves and Planckian dissipation. So they had a theory for that. And then they put materials on this nice plot uh, where you have the peak divided by temperature and it looks like a constant and then everything is Planckian and we're happy. Uh, but this is a log scale. And then there is a variation of 25 here factor of 25. So it's not a constant. One thing that uh, is nice here that uh, one of the assumptions is that there is strong disorder, even if the system is not disorder. And this, we like it very much. So we took all these measurements and, uh, and put them, uh, studied the frequency of this dis display through the peak versus temperature. So first of all, is not Planckian in this optical sense. Uh, Planckian would imply a slope of one if you plot omega peak versus t. This is log log. You have all sorts of slopes going from zero to 1.5. Um, and uh, okay, so there's a puzzle again here in metals. And let's try to see some spherical cow uh, model. And this is 
the most basic electron boson interaction model you can think of. It's the Holstein model, so only local interactions. And on also, let's make it even simpler. Because we're interested in slow bosons, let's take the quantum part, uh, the, the momentum of the phonons, of the bosons, uh, to be zero. So if we calculate the optical conductivity of such a model in this limit, in two dimensions, we get something that clearly resembles uh, the experiments. Not only that, there is this peak that is controlled by temperature. Um, actually, this peak frequency, as I was mentioning, is related to localization. So it gives you a direct measure of the localization length. Uh, of course, in two dimensions, there is no conduction, but through this relaxation time approximation I was telling you about, you can make this go from zero to a finite value, and then you have access in principle to the conductivity. So we can study the behavior of the peak. Um, oh, one important thing. There's no way you can capture this phenomenon by single side DMFT because it's related to non-local interferences. And then if you do DMFT, it looks pretty much like the exact diagonalization result everywhere except at low frequencies where you're missing the localization. So the peak, this is the peak frequency uh, that versus temperature that we've served for different interaction strengths and it pretty much looks like the experiment. Okay, and then you can make a transport phase diagram of this model. So this is interaction strength and temperature and so if you go to two large interactions, you get formation of bound states, polarons. Uh, we don't want to go there. There's also some charge density wave instability. As we heard, instabilities are all over the place. But if we ignore this, there is a huge region here, especially at high temperatures, where transport is anomalous because of this mechanism. Uh, there's a recent paper by Kivelson uh, reporting a similar phase diagram. They also played the game of this relaxation time approximation and they get more or less linear resistivity. Okay, how much time do I have? Um, oh, then I can slow down. <laughs> That's nice. Okay, so um, we started from semiconductors. There was a puzzle. Uh, it made us think about some different way of seeing transport and optical absorption. And then we tried to apply this to metals and it seems also to have some connection with experiments. Uh, there's competing theories of this display through the peak around and uh, I won't talk about them, but if we stick to the plan and say, Okay, let's go as far as we can go with this idea. Of course, that model I showed here, uh, that's the model for electron phonon interactions in molecules, but you can think of this degree of freedom of, as any both like collective excitations, critical modes, uh, ferroelectric modes, you name it. So, of course, you, here you don't get any correlation, spatial correlation of this disorder, but you can decorate this model as much as you want. Um, yes. Yes. That would decay the space with the power law. Uh, probably depends on that power law. Yes. I, I think so. I think you're right. Do you know what? Uh, I don't know what's the critical power law. Okay, so uh, there is many candidates, as I said, for these bosons, and I want to come back to the organic conductors and uh, and suggest that uh, the glassiness or the tendency to glassiness might have something to do with. It. So, um, of course. Because there is displayed through peaks all over the place, you might ask the question if there is one universal mechanism or many, uh, well, we have no idea. We're just exploring this one. So 
this is many electrons with long range interactions and uh, they generate some slow collective charge excitations as i will show you and uh, you can see this as some disorder so i guess you have been to a concert some time either recently or in your past and then you're you're here and then you get thirsty and then the beer is, is here so you want to go get your beer but then you want to go back to the close to the stage so when you try to travel towards the stage well the number like number of particles number of mass is conserved so if you move this way you need some collective readjustment uh, around you uh, that moves backwards because otherwise everybody will pile up under the stage and that's not possible so this process is very slow and there is because there is a lot of interaction and uh, so it increases the viscosity so this is a, a, a real life picture of, of glass now of course uh, there has been another real life uh, uh, observation of this and this is in these charge cluster glasses uh, that where you have, have a coexistence of like strong spots uh, signaling ordering in the x-ray patterns but also some diffuse rods that indicate that, that uh, it's very difficult to choose an ordering wave vector there is many competing orders around and you get very strange transfer properties um so by the way uh, okay let me skip this there's another uh, system we have heard about today where all these long-range interactions play a big role and it is bilayer systems but I won't go into uh, this uh, they have observed all sorts of Wigner crystals there so let's go back to theory so that's the sketch uh, you have electrons uh, on a lattice and uh, they not only interact when they're on the same side but also they interact when they are on distant sites and let's take this power law to be it can include one over r when it's long one over r cubed when it's dipolar or we can let this exponent go to infinity and then it's just nearest neighbor interaction it's the extended hover so uh over the years we've been studying this with different techniques uh starting with Heine, who's here back in 2009 uh, so we've done exact diagonalization at zero temperature, classical Monte Carlo at finite temperature. Uh, I'll tell you about in a minute about mixed quantum classical simulations, and we are now exploring the fully quantum solution at finite temperature. So let's go to zero temperature. Uh, to make the thing simpler, we are at quarter filling on a triangular lattice. Uh, let's forget about the uh, local interactions because the holes are sufficiently distant that they don't see each other often. So this is the phase diagram. Uh, so alpha is the range of the interaction. And um, large alpha here is short range. Uh, low alpha is long range. So first of all, as we all know, for the extended Hubble model, we get threefold order when we're quarter filling on the triangular. This is correct now if we reduce uh, the i mean if we increase the range this is no longer the most stable state but stripes are favored so you have alternating stripes of full and empty sites and so there is this whole stripe phase that you can call a Wigner crystal um now let's focus on long range genuine coulomb which is alpha equal one so what you see here is that actually when uh when you increase the range goes down so the the order becomes more and more fragile this is indicating that there is some collective excitation that is destroying that is melting the crystal that is going down and going to lower and lower energy and it's uh, getting easier and easier to excite. 
Yeah, V over T is one ten hundred and T over V is one zero point one. Down is very large. Yeah, this is the large interaction. Sorry, I should have. So I need a larger interaction if I have longer rings uh, coupling to get that. Uh, yes. So the thing is that this here is the mean field transition, and so you are revealing this whole region here where you don't have long range long range order anymore. You have it's melting, but you still have short range order, and this is a huge regime. So when alpha equal one, this this is about three or four or five, and this is thirty. So there is this intermediate region that we are studying. This is uh, exact diagonalization at t equals zero. For spinless, uh, we can get to 36, but 24, 18, and 12 give exactly the same answer because we are minimizing size effects by some clever twisted boundary conditions and eval summations. No, then the number of sites. So it's 18 electrons on 36 with symmetries, but 18 is more than enough. Okay, so now let's uh, see the consequences at this long range uh, one over R. So the spectral function opens a pseudo gap before it opens the gap at uh, the transition. So there is a pseudo gap developing. You can uh, calculate the quasi particle property. So, this is the Drew the weight. This is the quasi particle renormalization. And this A is the weight at the chemical potential. And uh, when you increase the interactions, they all go pretty linearly zero. And within the resolution of this small system, they all indicate that there is a transition here. Note that when you're close to the transition, this is a very strongly correlated system, and there's no spins here. It's just long range interaction. Now, the, the surprise comes when you look at the spectrum of the collective excitations. So we know that it orders like stripes. So if we look at the stripe order, the frequency of that mode is going to zero at the transition. This is all expected. But now if you look at the overall integrated spectrum of collective excitations, now it's soft and within the whole, uh, within the whole pseudo gap regime here, it's very soft. This is 0 0.2 times the hopping integral. The bandwidth is nine times. So there's a factor of, there's almost two orders of magnitude. So the picture we get is that Individually, the electrons want to hop very fast, but collectively they can't, and they develop these very slow uh, motions. And you can actually uh, plot the distribution of electrostatic potentials that come from this disorder, and uh, uh, so you, you can characterize this. So this is zero temperature ED. Uh, we want to go to finer temperature to study transport. And then um, this is the idea. So this is painfully slow, but it's done for a purpose. <laughs> so this, imagine that this is the collective motion. This is so slow that you can treat it classically. So we do some classical Monte Carlo for that. But then for the fast motion of the electrons, uh, we can imagine that this, is frozen, and then we take a single electron picture of this particle in the background of the other, because we have shown that there is this separation of energy scales. And um, so we have started doing this. Uh, let me show you again uh, something that relates to Professor Canoda's talk. Uh, if we look at the um, spatial distribution of these electrostatic potentials as we get them from the Monte Carlo. So on this column here, you have uh, density. So you have either zero, one, or two electrons per site. This is our square lattice, but too many. 
um, you can track the resulting electrostatic potential that comes from this distribution of charges. And then it's this statistical distribution. So if you're in a liquid, which is high temperature or large uh, bands, uh, the density is disordered, the potential is disordered, and also it has this Gaussian shape. Now, if you go towards order, of course, ordering here is checkerboard, you have one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. The potential is also ordered, and the distribution is bimodal with two spikes. There's only two different types of site. Now there's this intermediate region, which is the one that tends to glassiness, where actually you have a coexistence of regions of order and regions that are disordered. And actually this spectrum here is some kind of superposition of these two. So here you have order and you have the two spikes. And uh, here, oops. Here you have the disorder region. And uh, this was or wasn't shown, uh, flashed by Professor Kenoda yesterday. So this is what they measure for the distribution of uh, local densities by Raman. And it looks pretty much the same as what we get from the Monte Carlo. So the last question is what happens to quantum electrons now on top of this? Um, so we can calculate the optical conductivity, and this is the answer. So this would be the semi-classical thing. You have some broad Drude-like peak. And now, if you treat electrons seriously in this disorder potential, what you get is a displaced Drude peak. And um, not only that, but the resistivity, like the conductivity, becomes slower than uh it's classical so resistivity is higher so you get potential source of bad metal this is very very similar to the original spherical cow holstein model um so the proof of principle now it kind of is kind of verified with a different totally different boson that clearly has long range correlations because it's all long range but still it works and uh, you can play this game of calculating resistivity now this is for we had put these units but forget about them mm -hmm. so this would be the semi-classical value uh this has been uh calculated by hartnell again in uh, semi-classical fashion and if we do this quantum treatment we get a much higher resistivity but still it's pretty linear and uh so it looks both like a bad and strange metal so slow bosons, you can't treat them with Boltzmann um, and you can get slow bosons from long range interactions. And we have plenty of these long range interactions in organic materials. Thank you for your attention.